Welcome to Scary Stories. We've got our fifth podcast for you tonight, featuring an hour of scary dogman and werewolf stories. And this time we're starting it off with a brand new submission. We just got an email form the other day, and I thought it would be perfect for this audio-only show. And that brand new allegedly true 2023 tale is called The Invisible Werewolf. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I survived a night when I was under attack from a werewolf or dogman that could make itself invisible at will. The entire time I was screaming at myself to wake up because it felt like I was locked in some kind of an impossible nightmare. I'll tell you about it. If I wanted attention, I'd sign my real name to this. But I don't want that. I do want validation. I'd like to someday meet someone else who has had this same thing happen to them. I want to get to know someone else who survived this kind of a nightmare. I know I'm not insane, but I want to meet one person anywhere else who agrees with me about that. Sometimes I think that creature I battled all night was a monster, an unthinking, raging brute. Other times, though, I wonder if it really was some highly advanced being just pretending to be a monster for some reason that probably wouldn't make sense to me. After all, the ability to cloak yourself like on Star Trek seems pretty sophisticated. Is that really something this animal can do instinctively? Or was I actually dealing with an advanced creature using technology to hide itself? Maybe he was hiding in one way when I couldn't see him and hiding in a different way when he appeared as this brutish monster. That's half of my problem with this episode that I lived through, since I can't really tell what that was, or even what happened. It's harder to adjust and cope with the resulting trauma. I'm going to remember the details for you as well as I can, and maybe one of you guys can tell me what happened, because I'm not sure that I can tell you. So it all seems to have started when I noticed the dogman or werewolf or whatever he was. I had gone for what I had hoped to be a short hike in the woods behind my house in Wisconsin in the summer. And I found myself staring at a patch of woods that I thought I had seen something in. I thought I'd seen a man. But since it was a very large silhouette which I had glimpsed, I was trying to see it a second time to be certain. I didn't think there would be bear in that area, but it wouldn't be impossible, so I wanted to know for sure what I had seen before I took another step in any direction. So I was thinking it was either a man or an upright walking bear, and I didn't know if either would be a threat to me or not. I walked kind of stealthily closer toward the figure, which seemed to be staring intently at something in the opposite direction. I was seeing the figure from behind, that much I was certain of. I saw what looked like a shoulder, and bears don't have shoulders, not like this guy. But the shoulder appeared furry, so maybe it was a person wearing a fur jacket or coat. But then I stepped on a loud snapping twig, and the figure turned quickly to look at me. It made a sound like a feral animal, in spite of the fact that it stood like a man. But when I looked at this man's face, nothing human looked back. This was a wolf man. A dog man. It was wearing a fur coat all right, but the kind that was growing out of its own skin. I was looking directly at this upright walking werewolf type dog man. The kind with hands that end in clawed fingers. This guy was not all hulked out like the ones you talk about on your channel. This was a scrawny, evil looking guy who might not have even been six feet tall. He wasn't much smaller though, let's say five foot ten or eleven. But he looked wily, he looked agile, and he grinned his nasty looking dagger fangs into a smile that made me feel like I had to go to the bathroom. And then, he wasn't there anymore. He was just not there. 
It wasn't like he faded out. And it wasn't like he ran off. He just blinked out like on the Bewitched TV show from the 20th century. I don't know if you've ever seen that. The director calls hold. The cast holds in place. One element is removed or added. Then the director calls action and it's edited together later in post. Except this happened to me in real time. And there was no cute boing sound effect when the werewolf man disappeared. There was just the sound of my heart beating way faster than it was designed to beat. I turned around and started to walk home. At the time, I was freaking out over the idea that I might have just had a vivid hallucination. I wondered if I was sick or mentally ill, and all that scared me. I wasn't concerned any longer about the dogman or wolfman I had seen because, uh, well, it wasn't there anymore, right? I had broken up with a young woman about three months prior, and it had been a hard time for me. I got so depressed that a different ex-girlfriend actually took pity on me and gave me some MP3s she had of this weird little elfin guy named Eckhart Tolle. And his worldview really helped me through that hard time. Feeling scared in the woods, I started trying to remember things that he had said which had calmed me down a month or two prior. Nothing was coming to me though, and so I just started chanting affirmations. I told myself that everything was fine, and then I was going to go home and take a shower and eat some food. And then my blood sugar would even out and I wouldn't see any more of these hallucinations. But while I was giving myself that pep talk, I heard a growl coming from behind me. And I started running. I ran as fast as I could. Taking breaks to gasp for air when I started to not feel my fingers and toes anymore. I seemed to be having a panic attack when I most needed my legs to function for me and carry me home. I remember holding on to a tree and desperately breathing in and out when something just came right up to me and shoved me. Something I couldn't even see shoved me and I fell to the forest floor. At first crawling, then walking, and then running. I sped away from the invisible dogman as fast and as hard as I could do it. Soon I realized I was lost. I heard the voice of Bugs Bunny in my head suggesting that I had taken a wrong turn in Albuquerque, but it didn't seem amusing to me any longer. I had to keep running, only now I had no idea where I was going, and I had no idea how long this chase would go on. I saw a small house in the woods, a one-room shack really, and I headed for it. I banged down the door which swung open revealing a messy room with a mattress in it, Junk strewn about, had a lot of spider webs which I was soon pulling off my face as I jumped inside. As I was closing the shack door behind myself, the wolf man or whatever it really was, barreled into the outside of the door, trying to push it back open and get in at me. This werewolf was manic, but it was not stronger than I was. I am maybe a couple or three inches taller than that thing, since I'm six one and a half. I'm in better shape now since that event, but I did go to the gym regularly in those days, and I was a fairly strong guy. I was able to hold the werewolf off, and I was able to get the door shut. And then I sat down with my back to that door, and I was finally able to start to catch my breath inside that dusty shack, even with that creepy dogman still trying to push his way in behind me. Once my heart had calmed down a bit, I felt so tired. I just wanted to go to sleep. The constant repeating pattern of the wolfman banging on the door I was leaning against felt so disorienting. And once again, I wondered if I was dreaming or if I was having a nightmare. I just wanted to sleep. And I must have passed out because I remember coming to and noticing that it had become dark out. I sat there listening for a while, wondering if it would be safe to move. There was one small dirty window in the shack, but I couldn't see out of it from where I was sitting on the ground with my back holding that door shut. If I stood up to look out, that meant leaving the door unprotected. Still, I felt incredibly curious, and I wanted to take a look out that window. I knew that even if I saw nothing out of the ordinary... It didn't mean the creature might not still be out there, invisible, waiting for me to make myself vulnerable to it. Still, I had an emotional need to look out that window, 
So I got up as quietly as I could, and I took one step forward. Then I leaned my face in front of the window when... Crash. Something came flying through the glass at my face. I threw myself sideways back down against the door, and I avoided getting most of the glass in my face and hair, but not all of it. I thought it was the creature reaching its claw through that glass at me, and I was screaming like a complete lunatic. Once I had landed back down against the door, though, I realized it was a rock that had been thrown through the glass. And then just like that, the door started being thumped again behind me, banging into me over and over, just as though this were beginning all over again. I sat there and I cried, a grown man sitting and crying in frustration. There was nobody to blame except myself. I hadn't watched where I was going, and now I was in a shack in the woods, someplace possibly miles away from home. This was all my own fault. I vowed that if I got out of this situation alive, that I would carry my cell phone with me when I left home, like regular people do. I vowed that I would learn to use the GPS on that phone, that I would get on the grid like a good little lemming. I was so scared I basically completely sold out any part of my personality that had once had integrity. Promising anything I could think of, if I could only get out of this situation unharmed. Once again, I fell asleep with the door being banged into from the outside. Once again, I woke up with a start, but this time it was light out. I could see that the window glass was everywhere except in that window frame, and I wondered why the dogman hadn't come in to get me through that opening. I looked at the little window and I guessed it was too small for the creature to climb through. I guess it could become invisible, but it didn't know how to make itself smaller. And it didn't know how to walk through walls. So there are limits to the beast man's abilities. And that means he can't just be a hallucination or a bad dream. He's got to be real. But a real what? I think I spent a half hour testing to see if that invisible dogman was still out there somewhere. Waiting for me. But when I didn't get any reaction to any of the moves I made... I decided to make a run for it. I didn't know where I was running to, but I ran there fast. Of course, it turned out I was surprisingly close to a road I was familiar with, and I found it easy to get home in the morning sunlight once I was calm. I probably could have spent that last night at home if I'd only made one turn differently. But maybe it's better this way. After all, do I really want that creature to know where I live? Coming up later in this show, my daughter can't help being a werewolf. But first, man dog. My dog is a werewolf. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I would like to alert you and your listeners to the fact that werewolfism is not merely an illness affecting human beings. It can be caught by canines as well, including your house pet. I learned this the hard way, back in the 90s, when my mixed breed mutt named after Data from the Star Trek got infected and became a werewolf for the last four years of his life. Those were not easy years, either for us or for him. Still, he lived to be 12, which is not all that bad in dog years. We had to put up with an awful lot toward the end, though. When he passed, it was during the new moon, and had nothing to do with his werewolfism. So this was not a tragic thing, really. Data had a family surrounding him, who were all pulling for him. Otherwise, it would have ended much sooner and much nastier as well. So I'll try to start this at the beginning, but none of us really can be sure what the actual beginning was. He was eight years old before the first time he became that other thing, and he only changed on a full moon. Someone once suggested to me that he always had been a dogman, but he only matured at age eight. And that wouldn't explain why he only walked upright under the full moon, though. And I wouldn't explain why he grew human ears when he transformed. Just as humans are said to grow dog ears when they become a werewolf. 
So how did this happen to my dog Data? Was he bitten by a human being? I mean, we don't know that he wasn't. So here is what happened the first time Data the dog transformed. I was inside the house and I heard the dog growling at something out back. And then I thought I heard something larger growling back at my dog. From the sound of it, there must have been a bear or a timber wolf or something big facing off against my pet. So I grabbed a baseball bat and I headed outside. But when I got out there, it looked to me like Data wasn't facing anything larger than a squirrel that was up in a tree. I was confused about where that growling was coming from. So I walked out there into the yard to see what was going on. Well, that was a mistake. Data turned to face me, and I screamed. His head wasn't his head anymore. It was sort of like a skibbity toilet moment way back in the 80s or 90s. It was this guy's head on my dog's body. And so I screamed. To be clear, it was not an ordinary man's head. It looked like he was transforming into a man and then stopped somewhere about a third of the way through the process. It was horrible to look at. Sort of nauseating, really. His head had grown taller, as though his brain had as well. He had a forehead now, and he had human ears on the sides of his head. He also still had his dog ears on top, though. That's what I mean when I say he looked like he got stuck in the middle of transforming into a human. It wasn't just his head that was weird, either. His arms looked much more human than before. Yeah, I said arms, but I mean his front legs. Now they looked like arms, and one of them was nearly bald. That made it look even more human than the other one, which was still covered in fur. Neither arm had a hand at the end, but the paws that were there were more like clawed hands than paws anyway. As far as I can remember, his back end was mostly the same as before, but he seemed far more energetic, and he seemed far more feral and angry as well. I know I said he had grown a forehead, and I know it looked like his brain must have grown larger, but he certainly did not act any more intelligent. In fact, he seemed downright stupid to me. I called out to my dog questioningly, wondering what had happened to him. He turned his attention toward me, and then I swear he bared his teeth and crouched down, making a snarling sound, like a wild animal might. He was about to pounce on me. My own dog of eight years had lost his mind. I ran to the house, and he sprinted after me. I screamed, and he landed on my back, which set me into a panic. I spun around, allowing my momentum to pull me down, and I landed hard on my dog, who was no longer my dog, but a man-dog. This worked to knock the wind out of him enough that I bounced off and got a few steps head start on him toward the back door. Data, or whatever the hell he had become, got up and ran after me on his hind legs. I was screaming like I saw a ghost or the boogeyman, I swear to you. The whole world had gone crazy. It was insane. Or maybe I was insane. I got my hand on the doorknob, but Data was right behind me. So I closed my eyes and swung my Louisville slugger as hard as I could. I felt it hit the monster that was once my dog so hard. I'd have cleared the fences in a major league ballpark with that hit. It only knocked that monster back a couple of steps, though, and he fell on his butt. That gave me time to get inside and close the heavy door behind me, only a second before the man-dog threw all of his weight into it. I hadn't even had a chance to lock it yet, but believe me, I double-locked it once I could. The man-dog ran off into the night, and I had no idea what I should do about it. Should I go out and hunt my own dog down? What if he attacked someone out there? I didn't know what had happened to him. Maybe he had some kind of rabies. Maybe I should call the cops about him. I talked about it with my wife, the one I was married to in those days. She felt I might only cause a panic. We had seen the man-dog running toward the woods. My wife felt that he was out hunting smaller prey. She didn't think he'd run into town or anything like that. 
And if he did, half the town was carrying heat in those days, so the problem would get taken care of in all likelihood. Her thinking seemed cold to me, which I think is why we eventually divorced. But I followed her advice that night anyway. Honestly, I was too scared to go out there after that man-dog anyway. When it stood up on its hind legs, it was taller than I was. Plus, I didn't want to hurt Data, but he had no qualms at all about trying to hurt me. It wouldn't be a fair fight, you know? So, basically, we spent the night watching TV programs scheduled for us by the rich, which was what everyone all did at the same time in those days. And then we went to bed after Jay Leno's monologue. In the morning, it was like none of this had happened. Data was at the back door looking like his old friendly self again, asking for breakfast. I was so happy to see him. I didn't think twice about flinging the door open and giving him a big hug. I threw his frisbee and we launched right into a game like nothing had ever happened. In fact, if my wife hadn't also seen him running into the woods on his hind legs the night before, I would have just decided that I was working too hard, and I had imagined the entire episode. But my wife had seen the man-dog, and she ordered me to figure out what to do before nightfall brought the monster back. I rigged up our basement with a heavy-duty chain and a collar that was supposed to be strong enough to hold a lion. I installed a new strong security door at the entrance to the staircase leading down to the cellar. Then, when the late afternoon came, I brought Dana downstairs with some food and water and some of his toys, and I chained him up. Then we played games and hung out, and we both fell asleep together down there in each other's arms. I woke up with a blanket thrown over me, so my wife must have been brave enough to venture downstairs and check the scene out. Data didn't become the man-dog again the next night, either. I declared the entire thing a fluke, but my then-wife noted that it had happened on the night of the full moon. I checked the calendar and she was right. So the next month, I started chaining the boy up in the basement two days before the calendar said the full moon was going to be. Sure enough, on the third night, that dog turned into a freak all over again. I had to run upstairs and bolt the door from the other side. The most horrible noises came from downstairs, and my wife forced me upstairs to bed where I couldn't sleep. This was how we lived for the last four years of that boy's life. I wish I could understand how this had started. Then maybe I might have been able to figure out what to do about it. My wife suggested that I speak to the pastor at our church. Possibly the dog is possessed, she reasoned. So after church one Sunday, I made an appointment to talk to the pastor in private about it. When I explained that my dog transformed once a month into a werewolf man-dog, he remained very quiet. After some extended silence, he suggested that we both pray for guidance on this subject, and then he opened the door for me to leave. When I got home, my wife told me that she'd received a panicked call from our pastor, telling her that her husband had lost his mind and urging her to leave town before I got back home. Needless to say, we found a different church, and we never told that second pastor about our man-dog problem. There was one time that I saw data change on a day that was not the full moon, and that is a story unto itself. He and I had been playing frisbee, and then we were sitting together on a warm autumn evening. It was sundown and just starting to get a little bit chilly. I was waiting to get in the mood to walk home for dinner, when both of us saw this white light off in the woods. It was dusk, not quite dark yet, but not daytime anymore either, and I couldn't figure out what could be making such a bright light. I felt a sense of alarm that it might be a car or a motorcycle or something driving right at me and Data through the woods. So I stood up, trying to see it better. When the light emerged from the foliage, I didn't see any vehicle or person behind it. I just saw what looked like a very bright, big light, and that seemed to be all it was. There was nothing behind it. There wasn't anything behind it, and I couldn't see what the light was made of other than light itself. As the light came into the clearing that I was in with Data, I noticed for the first time that the dog was standing at attention on all fours, 
staring intently directly forward at this light, frozen in place, head unmoving. And then I noticed he had the man-dog head, and he had the man-dog arms. He was the man-dog, but he had not gone feral. He had frozen into place, staring directly at the light in front of us. He was so still that I couldn't be sure he was still breathing. I had never seen anything like this in my life. I have never seen anything like it again, either. Suddenly, the bright light lifted straight up into the air, and Data stood up on his hind legs to watch it disappear into the sky. Only it was Data again, not the man-dog. He barked at the light as it receded upward and out of our sight, and then the two of us walked home. How I wished I could ask that dog questions about what had just happened. I wished I could get answers from him about what was going on. I wondered if that light had something to do with him becoming a were-dog, and I still wonder about that to this day. I suppose it might have just been a random weird thing that happened to us, but I guess I'll never know. I took him to a vet I had known for almost 20 years, but the guy listened to my story and then told me I needed a shrink. He told me that Data should be taken away from me, since I was having fantasies that he was a werewolf. I asked him if he wanted to come to my house on the full moon, and he asked me if I could hear how crazy I sounded. He told me that if I came back to him with a video that supposedly showed my dog becoming a werewolf, he would take moves to have me committed. My lawyer told me a vet couldn't have me committed, but I became rattled from his extreme reaction. I really didn't want a reputation as a lunatic or a dog abuser, so then I became afraid to tell anyone what was going on. Now so many years have passed and I'm so old that I just don't care if you think I'm crazy anymore. And that's the story of Data, the man-dog. My daughter can't help being a werewolf. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I'm a man trying to raise a teenage daughter without her mother, who passed away some years back. It's the legacy of her mother that Stacy has to live with. You see, my wife was a werewolf, and now that Stacy is becoming an adult, she is following in her mother's footsteps, unfortunately. This girl was shy growing up, but she's practically a recluse now. She can transform two or sometimes three times a month, and it is around the full moon. But she can start to grow hair on her arms or her eyebrows thicken or, or she even starts to get a sort of a five o'clock shadow just randomly, unannounced, and she doesn't even sense it happening. This can be a hard time for any young person, but a girl suddenly growing a beard randomly is a terrible setback to her social life, which hadn't even really had a chance to begin yet. I wanna find specialists to take her to. But Stacy doesn't want to end up in medical journals and then history books as the freak wolf girl. I tell her that she'd be helping other girls like herself out, but that doesn't help. That's the kind of thing that matters to guys, I think. Stacy told me she wants to have a family of her own, and she wants to sacrifice for them, not for some random idea of other girls like her. She doesn't want attention. She wants love and a husband and children, but she's not going to get them if she's afraid to come out of her room. Stacy's still got half her senior year in high school to make up for, but she says she will get an equivalency diploma someday. Neither of us care about her going to college because, you know, we're not communists who hate America, so my only concern is helping my daughter find a way to meet other guys around her age that she can socialize with, guys who are going to be men about her situation and not little babies. She's going to need a guy who's up to the task of being a husband to a woman who changes when it's the full moon. Well, I mean, I mean, even more than usual. I have not had to lock Stacy up when she transforms. In fact, she usually stays next to me, whimpering through the entire episode. I'm not sure it will get worse, but she says she feels that it will. She has not fully transformed yet, but the situation does seem to progress a little each month. At this rate, even if it continues worsening, I still don't think she would fully transform until she was in her later 20s. Maybe it comes in spurts, though. And maybe next month I'll be finding myself fending off a feral animal. Or maybe next week. Or maybe never. 
Not all dogs are prone toward viciousness. And some wild canines never get good at hunting and have to scavenge instead. So even if Stacy does progress into more severe transformations as she moves into adulthood, I don't consider it a guarantee that she would necessarily have to be a nasty one. Some dogs are timid and scared. Have you ever comforted a dog during a thunderstorm? Stacy's been that kind of werewolf, at least so far. I don't think this situation makes her stronger. I think that for her, this really is a curse or an illness. Sooner or later, I will prevail upon my daughter to let me bring her around to be examined. Maybe because her case seems milder than the other ones I hear about on your channel and elsewhere, she might be able to be cured. And that might open doors to this subject being discussed more openly. We can bring an end to werewolfism until we allow it out of the closet and allow science to study the subject. Any doctor right now who announced that he was going to study lycanthropy would be ending his own career. Well, maybe Stacy and I can change that. Or maybe she'll win out and remain in hiding. In neither scenario does she get the family she wants, and that's what I would rather help her get. It's hard to know what to do when you really can't understand the situation you're dealing with, and the only thing I can tell for certain about all of this is that my daughter can't help being a werewolf. Hey, I just want to say I've been reading this fascinating book about the dogman and werewolves written by the late Linda Godfrey. It's a real classic on the subject. I've noticed that there are some sharp discrepancies between her version of a certain famous classic dogman appearance in the 20th century and the History Channel's version of the same event. I'm working on a semi-animated episode using maps and imagery to illustrate visually the two different versions as they're explained. Try to get closer to the truth than possibly anyone has ever gotten before. You know you can get the audiobook version of this important book for only $6 if you follow the link in the description and you help out our channel if you do. And now for something completely hairy. Wolf Riders Dear Scary Stories NYC my mother used to tell people that I had imaginary werewolf friends. That wasn't true at all. I had very real friends who rode large wolves. Could those have been werewolves? I'm not sure. I just remember that the ladies were the most beautiful people I'd ever seen. And the wolves were all taller than I was in those days. This happened during the three summers that my mother and I spent living with our elderly relative. I was a girl of 13 that first summer. Far too old to be having imaginary friends. Either those were real people of some sort, or maybe there was something intoxicating in the atmosphere of those woods, because I continued to see them when I was 14 and 15 as well. They were only there in the spring and summer. They left sometime early in autumn, and I don't know if they went south or just went indoors when it got cold. Our sickly relative lived off Chandler Hill Road, near Gaylord State Forest area in Michigan. When I say she lived off the road, I mean she lived down a dirt road from the main highway. In the summer, those woods were fairly impenetrable because of the overgrowth of vegetation. And in the winter, because of the snow and cold weather, if I'm 83 now then that means it's 70 years since my first summer in those woods. And over 60 years since the house burned down. I'd advise you not to go looking for it. The last person I know of who did go search for the remains of that building told me he fell down into the basement before he realized he was standing right where the old house used to be. That must have been the late 70s, early 80s. I don't know if there's anyone left alive but me that can remember that there used to be a house back up there in that forest. The wolf riders never came too close to the house, to be honest. I would be wandering alone in the trees when we would come upon each other. The first time I saw them, there were a bunch of beautiful older girls, all standing in a circle around another beautiful young woman. And they were all blonde and had an unearthly kind of beauty to them. 
when they spoke, with their strange accent though, their words were harsh and cruel. They each in turn pointed at the girl in the center of the circle and stated loudly that this girl had committed some offense. She had hoarded food, said one girl. Another pointed at her and accused her of being vain. Several of the others concurred on that accusation. The volume of surly comments grew louder, and they began speaking over each other. Meanwhile, the sad, lonely girl at the center of the circle was crying and whimpering, begging for mercy. I felt terrible, so I burst out of my hiding spot and I ran to her. I didn't know that young woman, but I was a kid and I felt sorry. I threw my arms around her and I asked them if they couldn't see that she was sad and sorry about what she had done. They all shut up for a second, looked at each other, and burst out laughing. I was confused. The girl they had been shouting mean things at joined in with the laughter. Then she told me that they were just playing crow's court, and it was her turn to get to be the bad crow. She complimented me for my bravery, charging out into a group of wolf riders as I had done. I asked her what she was talking about, and she walked me a ways further into the woods. That was when I noticed the large wolves. They must have been standing there the entire time, but I hadn't noticed them until they were pointed out to me. I was probably just being inobservant, but to me at the time, it was like magic. When she showed me that wolves as large as horses had been standing 40 or 50 feet away from me the entire time I'd been watching their crow's court game. How had I not heard them? How had I not smelled them? They smelled like backstage at the circus, if any of you are old enough to remember real circuses with trained animal acts. A couple of the wolves were larger than horses. Not quite elephant-sized, but larger than horses, that was for certain. I asked if I could ride one of the wolves, and they said I was too young. I asked if I could join them and run away with them. That made them all laugh, and they had the most beautiful kind of laughter. I asked again, telling them that I wanted to listen to their laughter for the rest of my life. I was told that I should be careful what I wish for. They began mounting their canine steeds and I felt so sad. I asked them if I could please see them again and they all looked to this one girl so I knew she was the leader. She looked unhappy to have to deal with this but it was clear the other girls wanted me to be able to meet with them again. The leader said it might not be good for me that I was both too old and too young to be seeing them in the first place. I don't really know what that meant but each of the three summers, at least one of the wolf riders called me, both too old and too young, to be there with them. I would laugh when they would say things like that. Only kids or older people can see them. I figured they were some sort of self-absorbed rich girls, claiming magical powers for themselves, and then humoring each other about their great abilities and their magical prowess. I so wanted to go with them, to live whatever kind of life they were leading. They must have had rich fathers to afford such large, lovely, and well-trained wolves. I thought they must live in houses with servants and chocolate bonbons. I suspected they might have desserts with French names served on silver platters. When I was one year older, though, I encountered them again and was brought to what they described as a feast. There were no chocolate bonbons there. This was a feast cooked in a cauldron over a fire. It smelled good, but when I asked what was inside it, the response I received was, what isn't inside it? That was an answer that made me shudder. But when I got hungry enough, I ate their meat soup. It had things in it that looked like weeds and roots to me, but they tasted like nothing I'd ever had before. We went to sleep under the stars with no tents or beds. When I complained of the ground being too hard to sleep, I was told to ask the grass to become softer. When I complained that I was cold, I was told to ask the woods to warm me up. When I complained to a second person, they gave me the same advice as the first one. I thought I was being made fun of until I overheard another girl asking the grass to please warm up a bit. So I asked the grass to soften 
and I asked the woods to warm up. Everybody laughed at me. Good and long and hard. Then someone threw me a blanket to wrap myself up in and we all went back to sleep. I never knew what was real when I was around them. But I can't say I really minded it all that much. That summer when I was a year older, they started to teach me to ride their youngest and smallest wolf. He would never go above a trot. And he bit me once. I was told I should say he only bit me once and to focus on not annoying him so he wouldn't bite me a second time. None of the wolves bit me a second time because I did learn how to do things in the way they liked. They actually enjoyed us riding them as long as we did it the right way. You had to pay attention to them and their subtle changes just as they paid attention to you as you rode them. There were also cues they gave that you needed to immediately shut your mouth and become alert too. My grandson has a car with motion picture cameras hidden inside of it somewhere, so he can watch all these little TV shows about what's happening outside the glass windows that he could be looking out of instead. Well, when we rode those big wolves, they were our 360 degree motion picture camera system, so when they told you to pay attention, you had to do so immediately. We would encounter things in the woods which would sometimes require us to hide, or possibly to run away. One time we sneaked away when the wolves signaled to us that some large predator was nearby. I never found out if it was a bear, or a big cat, or what. I mean, what would be such a problem that these horse-sized carnivores would want to avoid it? It just dawned on me after seven decades that they might have been afraid of mankind. Maybe there were hunters ahead. I sometimes forget that we humans eat meat too. At least at the time I'm writing this, we're still doing it. When I was young, I always had hair that some people described as light brown and others called reddish blonde. These days they call it whatever name it says on the bottle, but back then my hair would be darker in the winter and blonder as the summer wore on. My family told me it was because I was out in the sun, but I felt it was because of those blonde wolf girls. Their wolves were blonde too. I had never seen that before. Even if they had been normal sized wolves, they would have been remarkable to look at. Their eyes were not pink, so they were not albino. They just had pale fur like polar bears. They were so soft to the touch. And I learned how to be trusted enough by them that I could brush them and de-louse them. Laugh all you want. I knew that if they were letting me pick their ticks and fleas off, that meant we were friends. The last summer I got to see them went by so fast, it was all over by the morning. I had noticed the prior summer that when I would come home from seeing the wolf girls, more time would have passed than I had expected. I thought it was just me being tardy and getting lost in my fun times. Everyone else thought so too, and it wasn't a big deal. But then my last summer in those woods, the girls didn't just invite me to their camp. They took me away with them to show me their world. When they returned me the next morning, summer had gone. My mom screamed and cried when I showed up. She and their elderly relative had thought I was gone. They thought I was lost forever. You see, to them, almost two months had passed since they had last seen me. For me, it was only one night, maybe ten hours max. I tried to explain, and they tried to explain, but it was like we were speaking different languages to each other. I was banished from leaving the house except to use the outhouse, but I felt I could understand their reaction. My mother and our relative didn't even want me leaving the premises. They wanted me where they could see me. That was how they put it at the time. And they would stare at me too, usually with baleful looks on their faces, shaking their heads with disbelief. Maybe I shouldn't have told my mother that I spent the night with the wolf riders and that they took me to their home. The girls had warned me that time moves differently for them. I asked them to explain what that meant but they just laughed at me and said I wouldn't understand. I remember telling them that I was old enough to get it, but they said our entire species wasn't old enough yet to get it. And that also seemed funny to the girls. 
My grandson refers to the Wolf Riders as living in another dimension. That doesn't really make sense to me, as it's not like we rode a rocket ship to get there. We just walked. We walked from the area behind my family's property down a path. A dirt road. It wasn't a yellow brick road to Never Neverland. It was just a dirt road made of dirt. And we walked on it. There were no flashing lights. There was no spooky mumbo jumbo. I didn't see reality fall apart and rejoin with itself. It was like a dirt road through the summer woods that led to the most beautiful place you can possibly imagine. I used to watch that program Fantasy Island because it reminded me of that valley. Well, also because I had a crush on Ricardo Montalban, but it was that Garden of Eden quality to the show that first got me to watch it. And that was what it felt like in the place where those wolf girls lived. It felt fantastic. It felt wonderful. Exhilarating. Exciting. None of these words suffice. The air was better there. Everything was superior. But I would need a new language to explain it. I think I was in my 30s or 40s when VHS tapes came out, but for the first time, I had something to compare to the experience of being in that forest that night that lasted seven weeks. Unfortunately, now VHS technology is so old that I don't know if any of you will even know what I'm talking about. Nevertheless, I shall endeavor. And now, uh, whether you remember or not, VHS tapes could be recorded on the two-hour mode or the four-hour mode. Or the six-hour mode. You could fit three times as much stuff on the six-hour mode. But the quality of the two-hour mode was far superior. Well, our ordinary life is sort of like living inside the six-hour mode. And when you step into the Wolf Rider world, it's in the two-hour mode. And three times as real as what you had thought of as reality before. That's the closest I've ever come to really explaining what it felt like to be there with them that night. It was worth trading in the entire summer to get to experience that, as I now have a standard to hold heaven to after I die. It had better be at least as wonderful as the place the Wolf Riders lived in back then. The night the Wolf Riders brought me into their world was a storytelling night. They took turns telling stories they knew by heart. Some of them were history lessons about their tribe. Some were entertaining stories about ancestors whose names I was unfamiliar with. That was the night when they told me the story of how they became an all-female tribe. See, once long ago, they were a race of people not too dissimilar to us humans. They bred like cockroaches, I was told. That seemed very funny to the wolf riders. They started to take over that forest. And so the forest itself decided to turn their men into those giant wolves. So then I laughed at them. I knew about the birds and the bees by my third summer in that place. I knew they couldn't have babies if they had no men. They would go away after their generation died off without men. But that is why the forest made us immortal, was my answer. This time the expected laughter didn't come. They weren't kidding. They and their wolves didn't need babies to carry their race on. They just weren't ever going to die, you see. And it was the matter-of-factness about it that eventually let it sink in. This was the one time they weren't getting around. The trickster trick this time was that they actually meant what they were saying. They were expecting to live forever. Somewhere in another reality that you could walk to on foot in only a few minutes... They were expecting to live forever. Just a short walk from our backyard were eternal beings, riding huge blonde wolves that were once their husbands a long, long time ago in another life. But then nature itself decided it should be different. When I told my mother all this, she told me to be quiet and do my chores. So I didn't know that my time visiting their world with those girls was my last. And I suppose I'm lucky I didn't know about it. We had fun and talked about things we would do again the following summer. My elderly relative passed on that next winter, though. And we took what we could from our house to move to our next tiny little place, which was in Wisconsin. It was in a poor part of the suburbs. We had big carnivores there, too. 
but they were mostly the human kind. Sometimes I think that maybe I should go back to those woods and look for those girls. I bet they look the same as they did back then, or maybe a few months older. Maybe if I found them, they would let me travel with them, and maybe then I could live on forever just like them. Or maybe I'd slip and slide down into the basement of the old home I used to live in before I even realized where I was, just like that fellow did back in the late 70s or early 80s. Only at my age, that would end up being my final resting place. Still, if I'm feeling strong in the spring, I sure would love to go back to that ancient place. I don't think I'm still agile enough to get into the parts of the woods that the girls live in, but maybe if I'm lucky, and if I sit quietly enough, I'll be able to hear them playing Crow's Court one more time. And maybe I'll have one more chance to hear the laughter of the Wolf Riders. I tend to date monsters, or you are not a monster. You are a werewolf like me. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I grew up watching anything I could find that had werewolves in it, but my favorite show of all time was Teen Wolf. It came on when I was like 11 or 12 and lasted through my teenage years, helping me understand the kind of guys I liked. I decided early on that I was going to date bad boys, and if I could find any real werewolves out there in the world, I would especially want to get with them. The best werewolf on that show, in my opinion, was Liam, the one with anger issues. I thought it was weird that he sort of calmed down and got respectful after he became a werewolf. I kind of am usually on the lookout for a version of Liam that got even angrier after his change. You might say I'm the kind of woman who's up for a challenge. When I first set out to cause trouble in life, I had two best friends who created as many problems as I did. The three of us used to call ourselves werewolves, because that was before we found out werewolves are for real. We used to use that word to describe girls that were out looking for bad boys to burn the world down with. I dated one rich lunatic. I dated a bunch of poor ones. But it all led to the discovery of the underground. What do I mean when I say the underground? I don't know how to describe it. Any adjective used seems trite. The supernatural underground? The cryptid underground. The alien underground. None of them explains what I'm talking about. And they all sound kind of like corny names to me. The underground isn't a thing or a place anyway. It's just a bunch of social connections, really. Business relationships, too, I guess. It's a scene, kind of. It's a social class, too, sort of. My two compadres, they both became vampires. I mean, they don't use that term, but to me, that's what they've become. They serve this master vampire, which they don't call a master vampire. They call him Larry, but he's their master nonetheless. Me? I'm still a free agent. I want to keep having adventures for a while at least. My mother on her deathbed when I was 15 made me swear to her that I wouldn't settle down until I was at least 25 years old. I've still got almost two years on that, and I can't break my pact with my mother. She promised she'd haunt me if I did, and I'm really scared of ghosts. I'm not scared of werewolves at all. I love werewolves. But ghosts? I don't even want to think about them. People tell me that's dumb since a ghost probably can't hurt you, but a werewolf can bite your face off. But, you know, I tell them at least a werewolf can't fade away or walk through a wall. I mean, if he's alive, and he's a male then I can probably charm him out of hurting me. But some Casper-looking dude coming back from the afterlife? He don't care about what I say or do. He's been there and done that. When I was a teenager, my only rule for dating was to have fun. As I am now an older, mature lady of 23, I am starting to come up with some dating do's and don'ts. Number one, adventure over money. Dating rich guys is nice and usually preferable. In fact, it's better to go with the richer guy about 97 or 98 times out of every hundred. But sometimes a poor psychotic or a maniac can give you a much more fun night than even the richest rich dude. 
So if given a choice of a billionaire landlord who sits home and watches TV, or a completely broke motorcycle riding werewolf on the run from the law, who do we choose, ladies? That's right. We choose the bad boy. At least, if we can cover the price of gassing up his bike, because he probably just spent his last dime on liquor and weed. Rule number two is never forget rule number one, adventure over money. If I'm not narrowly avoiding death three or four times a week, I need a change of venue, you know what I'm saying? At least, that was what I was like until I met this guy that I'll get to later. He's the first guy I like that's more civilized than I am, but he's a werewolf. I can't explain him, so I have to leave him till later. He makes being nice seem like it's not lame. Let's call him Galahad, because he could have had this gal already if he wasn't so polite. He's the exception to all the rules. But first I want to tell you about some of the more hardcore werewolves I've almost lost my life with. I want to start with a werewolf I dated who stole from convenience stores. Let's call him Robbie McRoberson. The first time I went on a date with Robbie, we stopped at a convenience store to get some money and liquor. I thought he was gonna pay, but instead he wolfed out right in the convenience store guy's face, right? Becomes the werewolf right there in the store. The guy's pants get stained dark and his eyes roll back in his head. Then he faints and hits his head and we hadn't gotten any money yet. The register was locked and we didn't know how to open it, so we left there with nothing but the drinks and some snacks. After that, I suggested we try it a different way that didn't involve fainting. There's that old Linnea Quigley movie. She's one of my idols, Linnea Quigley. She did this thing in that one movie where she wears a short skirt and she bends over to look at magazines on the low shelf, right in front of the guy working the cash register. He can't take his eyes off her... merchandise. And meanwhile, her friend loots the store and the clerk never sees it. Or maybe it was two clerks, but you get the idea. So I did the Linnea move on the old Middle Eastern guy working the register. And Robbie filled up a bag with beer and food. And then, when he was ready for us to leave, Robbie brought a little package of, like, yodels or ding-dings over to the guy. And once the guy opens the register, Robbie wolves out. And that guy pees himself and faints, too. At least we got the money that time. I was sick of paying for our dates myself. I spent a week once with a psychotic werewolf who was driving across the country. That was how I ended up in Wisconsin in the first place. I'm not originally from here, but I've adapted quickly. Call me Linnea quickly, because it was the monster men around here that caught my attention. The man-wolves out here are looking for more long-term insanity from their women than back east. One night stands and two-week relationships are over. Some of the wolf men I met were more clinging than a wet rag. Sure, they try to boss you around, but they can't hide their neediness. I want a guy who doesn't need me, who couldn't care less about me, who could do better than me. Why else would I literally date monsters? The werewolves I met and came to love in Wisconsin were not all living around Milwaukee, or go into the underground clubs in that area. Some of them lived in the country and barely socialized at all. I don't know why I saw werewolves as city creatures. They really are more suited to living in the woods. I had always seen the woods as sort of lame before. I mean, it's so freaking quiet there. What could be more boring than quiet, right? And it's like so dirty. I mean, the ground is literally dirt. At least when there's garbage on the ground in the city, you can sweep it up. In the country, it's just like dirt. Good luck sweeping up the dirt when there's just more dirt underneath that dirt. I mean, the country seems completely unnatural and weird to me. Because I grew up in Brooklyn. And also another thing I'm learning about the woods and the werewolves that live in these woods here in the Midwest is that they are serious. They don't really joke around. And there are very few attitudes being thrown around that people aren't willing to back up with action. If you're on the scene, any scene, it's like playing poker. A lot of the time you don't need a winning hand to win if you can bluff your opponent and get them to chicken out and back down. It's not the biggest man who wins in New York. It's the smartest and slickest bully and manipulator of people. 
Not in the woods. In the woods, you do see some bluff posturing, you see some bluff charges. But they're done as warnings, not as tricks. There's a difference if you think about it. In Brooklyn, if you could trick people into thinking you were more bad than you were, you could get over on them for a long time afterward. They would do things for you and give things to you if you had them fooled into thinking that you were a somebody. In the woods, you can't bluff the same opponent more than once. Then you've got to back it up with action. It's like the difference between living on credit and paying cash money on the spot. The farce counts its change, and you better give it exactly the right amount of it. So then why am I thinking of moving out to live in the boring yet stressful forest? Well, for one thing, I'd be moving into a cabin with a guy that I know is a werewolf. So it's not like I'd be making a wise or smart choice. It's still life-threatening and dangerous. So it's not like I'd be acting mature. I promised my mom I wouldn't act mature till I was 25. No, I think I've definitely found a way to both settle down with a man and place my life in unnecessary and pointless danger. I might have found the best of both worlds. The guy, let's call him Marvelous Marv the Magnificent, is the finest looking man of either variety, human or werewolf, that I have ever seen. Oh no wait, I already said I was going to call him Galahad earlier, right? He is the be-all and end-all. He is so far out of my league, I should have to buy tickets just to see him. I could never do this good again, but he has one big major flaw. He is not evil. I mean, he's good. He's a nice guy. He gives money to homeless people. He holds doors for old ladies. He doesn't even rob convenience stores. There's something wrong with him. He's good even when he could easily get away with being evil. I've never met anyone like him before. I mean, technically he's kind of a goody two-shoes. But he also transforms into the most feral werewolf I've ever seen. He tells me it's not lame to be good. And he sounds like he means it. Of course it's lame to be good. To be obedient to your masters. They don't follow their own rules. They just want us to follow them. Like dogs. That's my problem with this guy. He's like a domesticated dog so much of the time. He stops at stop signs even. Who stops at stop signs? I know a werewolf who slows down when the traffic light turns yellow. Really. He also knows how to cook a lot better than I do. He told me he wants me to move in with him so he can fatten me up. Do you think he wants to fatten me up so he can kill me and eat me? Well, that might be exciting and dangerous, right? But who am I kidding? He's not a cannibal as much as I wish he were. He's a goody two-shoes werewolf. If I stay with him, I might start to become good like he is. I might start giving money to those less fortunate. I might start smiling at neighbors. Who smiles at their neighbors? Galahad smiles not only at neighbors, but he smiles and greets total strangers while walking down the street. Then that night he becomes a werewolf and hunts animals down in the forest, eating them raw after the catch. My Sir Galahad. I do enjoy visiting him. But could I really give up my social life and live in the woods with a guy who doesn't even use foul language? I've searched his computer while he slept and I couldn't even find any porn on it. What kind of guy doesn't store porn on his laptop? My Sir Galahad, that's him. The most boringest, muscle-bound, gorgeous, hulking monster of a werewolf I ever met. The bigger problem with this guy, bigger even than the boring, quiet woods he lives in, is that he gives me this feeling I never had before. He makes me wonder if I'm good enough for him. I usually feel like I'm too good for any guy. This way, when we break up, I don't even care. With this guy, I don't know if I can be good enough to deserve him. And then if we broke up, it would actually really hurt. It would confirm that I wasn't good enough for him, and I might never really get over him. That's a terrifying feeling. What if I had to get serious to keep this guy? Having adventures with werewolf trash is exciting, but this guy's more like werewolf nobility. At least he behaves in such noble ways. And he keeps surprising me with how elegant and civilized he can be. Not just for a werewolf, but in general. 
He's read all these old poetry books, and he can remember long passages of the most incredible poems. I don't even like poetry, except when he starts chanting it. And then it sounds amazing. He can say it in this way that's so much more musical than when I say the same words back. Maybe I should break the unwritten rule of life and be honest to this man? I promised my mother I wouldn't settle down till I was 25. If anyone would understand, this goody-two-shoes werewolf guy would. Then maybe he'd want to have adventures with me for another two years before we got serious. But, if I tell him that, he might just dump me and grab some other girl ready to settle down. I might never find a guy like him again. This might be my one chance for storybook happiness. Anyway, my main advice for dating monsters is to not get too serious. And here I am thinking of breaking my own rule. This is the kind of problem I have to deal with because I tend to date monsters. I've seen my werewolf boyfriend transform. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've been dating a guy who works at a county fair and who also happens to be a werewolf. All the girls are hot for him. Not because he's a werewolf, really, but because he looks like Jason Momoa's younger brother or son or something. The first time I met him, he was working one of those booths where you throw the ball and try to get it into the cup or whatever. He gave me one of the dolls just because I kissed him and I could tell he was a real werewolf. I ran my tongue over his fangs when I kissed him. He didn't even have to tell me that he was a werewolf. I told him. He laughed and said he might be a vampire. They have fangs too. I reminded him that it was daytime and the sun was out. He thought I was stupid, but I know vampires can't work as carnies. They would turn to dust like in the movies. But werewolves, they don't have a problem with sunlight, see? So when I told him that, the werewolf could see right off the bat that I'm smart. And he knew not to mess with my head. I had him figured out inside of two seconds. So I started to ask him if he could make me a werewolf too. And he said he could do it. But it would cost a lot of money. I asked why it would cost money. when he educated me that you need tiger's blood in order to make someone else a werewolf. And it's got to be blood from a living tiger. So it has to be drawn out of the great beast a little bit at a time over the course of months. So this carnival Jason Momoa told me I have till the fair comes back to town in the summer to raise a thousand dollars. He said that would give him enough time to draw all the tiger blood we would need for the transformation ceremony and that the thousand dollars would reimburse him for the cost of getting that tiger blood. Don't worry, I know he's not scamming me. I know he's a real werewolf because he let me see him transform. Well, actually, he made me look away, so I didn't actually see the change, but when he let me look again, he had much larger fangs in his mouth than before. I had to look away, and then he transformed back to human. I asked why he didn't show me a complete transformation into a complete werewolf, but he educated me about that, too. He said that if I had seen him become a full werewolf, he would have to then kill and eat me. And if I got eat then he wouldn't be able to make me a werewolf this coming summer. He told me that he's changed a number of guys into werewolves before, but I'll be his first female werewolf, so I'm sure this is just as special to him as it is to me, and it's very special to me. I'm not allowed to tell my parents or family or the police about what we're doing, because apparently he says werewolfism is not allowed in our state. Or changing people into werewolves is illegal or something. I forget exactly how he put it. Now I haven't talked to my parents in so long I doubt I'd remember their voices. Even though they sleep in the next room over from me. We communicate through Failbook. And all we do is say happy birthday to each other once a year. If I did tell them that I met a guy who looks like Aquaman that's going to turn me into a werewolf, 
I doubt they would even look up from their stupid phones anyhow. I'm still a few hundred short of the thousand dollars I need to raise, but it will be worth every penny to become a werewolf. And I know it's all real because I've seen my werewolf boyfriend transform. Hey, I just want to say I've been reading this fascinating book about the dogmen and werewolves written by the late Linda Godfrey. It's a real classic on the subject. I've noticed that there are some sharp discrepancies between her version of a certain famous classic dogman appearance in the 20th century and the History Channel's version of the same event. I'm working on a semi-animated episode using maps and imagery to illustrate visually the two different versions as they're explained. Try to get closer to the truth than possibly anyone has ever gotten before. You know you can get the audiobook version of this important book for only $6 if you follow the link in the description and you help out our channel if you do. And now for something completely hairy. And now, I'd like to end by thanking our channel members and PayPal Club members. First of all, we have to thank Godzilla Tim, who I will be thanking more formally in our Saturday night show this week. This man has joined twice to our channel membership, and he gave us five pounds British just last night on top of that. So yeah, we will be thanking Godzilla Tim again tomorrow. We also want to thank Kathy Barrickman, of course, as we always do. That having been said, we love all of our channel members and we are only still online because of the support of each and every one of you guys. I'm going to read out these randomly as they come up. All of these people are just as important to the channel as the others, and we love you all equally. In random order, thank you to Efren Kolunga, Mary Shabazz, Fraggy Dendron, a.k.a. Magara, James Fleming, Nancy Sears, Matthew Frederick, Ace Williams, who's also joined twice like Godzilla Tim, Innocencio de Divas, Anna White, Deborah Darcy, Julie Sadler, Ron Barracuda, who has been joined to our channel membership the longest. Blue Cruz, Super Spark, Victor O, Helena 66, Esteban P, Angie K, Roy Faulkner, Stel Cordova, Michelle Rich, Adam Friday, Hagridella, Jim Mooney, Deborah Ariola, Scott Fuller, Chris Nyhees, Stacy Miller, Tiffany Walsh, Melissa Kutch, John Smith, Dave Rabbit, Victor Collado, Fuzzy Lou, The Ender Werewolf, The Zoomancer, Michael A. Bell, Linda Hagler, Sarah Jones, James Tucker, Nicholas Carroll, Todd Graves, Mr. Spinks, Patricia Taggart, Franco Albi. What was that with three question marks? Valerie Gomez, a.k.a. Nicole Gomez. Long Island Bigfoot, who just signed up for seven months of memberships. Scott Halisic, Johnny Pasillas. Justin Simon, Anthony Johnson, and a special thank you and message for Jeff Kennedy. We keep getting PayPal payments from you, but your email no longer exists, so we have no way to send you the links to our members-only shows. I hope you're okay. If you're still with us and you hear this message, please connect a different email to your PayPal, or else please contact me with a different way I can send you the links. Hope all is well with you and with everyone still listening this late into the show. Please let me know if you'd like me to continue this podcast and try to make it a series, or if you think it's just a Halloween thing that we should drop in November. 
Please come back tomorrow on YouTube and Rumble when we will have a new story about a friendly dogman. Hope to see you then and happy Halloween.